Hi. Today we're going to start a new chapter, chapter 7, on deformation and strengthening mechanisms. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about the number, why are the number of dislocations present greatest in metals, and how are strength and dislocation motion related, and why does heating alter strength and other properties of um, materials. So first of all, to address the first question, why the number of dislocations is present greatest in metals. In metals, the motion of the dislocations is easier because it has that non-directional bonding, the metallic type bonding, and it has these really close packed directions for the slip. Um, so basically in a metal, you have all these ion cores and sort of this free electron C, and since the bonding is non-directional, it really doesn't matter which direction these metals slip. Remember what happens is basically you have atom hopping going on, and so if an atom or ion, I'm sorry, can't hop from one position to another easily, then slip won't occur and the dislocation won't move. Now that ex helps explain why it's really difficult for that to happen in ceramics because ceramics um, bond by ionic bonding or covalent bonding. And remember that in covalent bonding, it's very directional. So if a carbon is bonded to an oxygen, for example, it wants to be bonded to that oxygen in that direction. Um, and that makes it very difficult for an atom to hop from one position to another because it would have to totally break that bond um, and it, it just doesn't slip very easily. In ionic, in an ionic ceramic like sodium chloride or something, what would have to happen is that, for example, this positive ion would have to move over into a negative ion slot or at least pass through it. And that, it, it really doesn't want to do that because then it would be surrounded its nearest neighbors by positive charges and not negative charges and that's not very favorable, okay? So, what happens is the um, dislocation motion occurs when things are plastically deformed. Plastic deformation occurs by slip when an edge dislocation, which is that extra half plane of at atoms, slides over an adjacent half plane of atoms. So here you can kind of see a still frame version of that. Remember this little symbol right here, this little uh, T, upside down T, the red thing here, is a symbol for an edge dislocation. And it just kind of moves through. I have a little movie to show you of that that I'll show you real quick. Um, so here is that dislocation moving through the material. It's just a real simple little movie, um, but that's kind of what you see. Okay, if the dislocations can't move, then you can't get plastic deformation and it just doesn't occur. Um, also, the dif dislocations are going to be formed generally under stress. They're going to happen near existing dislocations or at the grain boundaries. That's where it's going to start. It's going to start at the grain boundary and move through. Okay? So the dislocation is going to move along a slip plane in a certain plane in a slip direction, okay? And that'll be, the slip direction will be perpendicular to the dislocation line. And the slip direction is the same as the Berger's vector direction, okay? So basically, um, here's a little cartoon of that. You have your, um, your shear stress applied here, and then it causes the dislocation to move along a certain plane in a direction, okay? So there's your edge, there's your screw dislocation. So which directions are these? Well, your slip planes are going to be the planes on which the easiest slippage occurs. And those are going to be the ones with the highest planar densities and large interplanar, interplanar spacings. And the slip directions, those directions of movement, are going to be the ones with the highest linear densities. And it chooses the highest density direction because remember, you're having atoms hopping from one position to another. And the directions with the highest densities are going to be the ones where hopping from one lattice position to another isn't very far, okay? So here's a little um, cartoon of an FCC material, okay? And the slip plane is going to be along the 111 because that's the tightest pack. That slip plane here is shown in this sort of orange colored triangle. And then here's the 2D view of that. So you can see that's a very highly packed direction. So here's A in the um, upper back corner. B is along the face. And so is C. It's along the back face. And there's D, E, F. And that shows you the little cartoon. Okay, so that's the slip plane. It's a very 
very high density plane. And then the slip directions are going to be along any one of these directions where it just has to hop to its nearest neighbor um, to move across. So that'll be sort of a family of directions along A, B, A, C, or from D to E, okay? Um, so there's going to be a total, there'll be more multiple slip systems in any given crystal. For FCC, that's 12 slip systems. And in BCC or a hexagonal closed pact, it'll be different directions, but it's the same concept. So an example, which of the following is the slip system for a simple cubic structure and why? Okay, so your choices are, you know, the 100 uh, family of planes along the 110 direction, or the 110 family of planes along the 110 direction, 100 family of planes along the 010 direction, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the solution is that it's going to be this one right here, this 100 family of planes along the 010 direction. Why? Okay, well, if you remember what a simple cubic system looks like, it's just a little cube with an atom sitting at each of the corners, okay? So the tightest, highest density plane is going to be along any one of the faces of the cube. That's the highest density. So I've shown that here in a little cartoon in a 2D view. If you cut across the diagonals, for example, that's not going to be as high a density because there's a larger distance in between the corners of the cube than there is along one one of the faces. So here's a pi cartoon picture of one of the faces and sort of a, a multiple cube stacking. So that's the um, family, so it's the 100 family of planes. And then it's going to hop also nearest neighbors. It's going to hop from center to center this way. If it hops along a diagonal, that's a further distance, and so it's not as tightly packed. And so that corresponds to the 010 family of directions. Okay, it's going to hop this way, this way, even in Z, um, and that'll be the direction chosen. Okay, so what happens is as you move that um, line of edge dislocation through, you're going to have a region of compression and a region of tension, okay? And the compression is going to be where the lattice is a little more tightly packed than it'd like to be. Then it'll feel a compression, it'll feel a strain in one direction, and the tension will be the lattice is a little further apart than it would like to be, so it's under tension there, okay? So there's a strain, a strain in the lattice around any given dislocation. Now what happens is, as these things move through the material, like strains repel one another, right? So if you've already got a compression, it doesn't want to move towards another compression because that would create even more compression and too much stress in the lattice. So what happens is uh, you get these likes repelling. However, uh, unlikes, if a compression sees a tension, it wants to move towards that, and that'll relieve the stress and hence lower the energy state of the system. And when that happens, they annihilate. So it's kind of a similar idea to positive and negative charges, right? When they move together, the net charge is zero. When a compression and a tension move towards one another, the strain goes away. And so that what, that's what happens when you get a perfect crystal there. Um, this was actually captured in a little TEM movie, and I hear I show you some still frames from the movie from uh, an Applied Physics Letters paper in 2011. Remember, TEM is transmission electron microscopy. And so if you stare real hard at this for a little while, you can see two edge dislocations. And they've labeled them here for the ease of the eye for one and two. And they initially started out about 2.3 nanometers apart. But over time, as they took the movie, these dislocations got closer and closer together until they annihilated and became a perfect crystal. So we're able to, these days, not just just talk about this in a theoretical way, but actually image it and see it happening, which is pretty exciting. Okay, um, another important concept to understand is the idea of a resolved shear stress and how that affects the dislocation motion. So let's say that you've put your bar or whatever in one of those tensile testing machines and you're giving it a pull, okay? Now, the thing is, your slip direction um, is going to occur along a direction that might not necessarily be aligned with the direction of the force that you're applying to the material, okay? And so what will happen is you'll have a force, um, but then that will not be aligned with the shear force, or the shear direction uh, for the plane, okay? 
Um, so you're going to have to resolve the shear stress. Only a portion of that force that you apply will go into causing slip. Okay, so how are those two things related? Um, well, basically, the you've got the dot product that you're going to take for the direction of the force applied to the direction of the force that is sheared, right? So you're going to resolve the force applied to the shear force, which is actually what causes the slippage. Um, so there's one dot product there where you're going to take the dot product of the applied force to the shear force direction. And the angle in between those two things is called lambda. Okay, so that's your slip direction versus your applied force. And then you're going to have to resolve the direction between your um, shear stress and the slip direction. Okay, and the angle there is phi. So that's the angle in between your slip um, direction and your applied force. All right, so your critically resolved shear stress, tau sub r, is going to be the shear stress that you apply from your load machine times the cosine of these two angles um, between the direction uh, of the applied force and the slip plane and the slip direction, phi and lambda. Okay. So the condition for a dislocation to move is that your resolved shear stress has to be greater than what's called the critically resolved shear stress. Okay. Now the critically resolved shear stress is typically around 10 to the minus 4 gigapascals to 10 to the minus 2 gigapascals. Okay. So here's an example of um, a very beautiful example of this. Someone grew a, a single crystal zinc rod. Okay, so it's a perfect crystal. And then they applied a, a tensile stress to the material, but the um, slip direction slip planes were not aligned, of course, with the direction of the tensile stress. And so you see these little directions of the slippage. And because it is a beautiful single crystal, then that turned into this kind of gorgeous looking looking little slip plane stair step thing where it's slipping right along the direction of the shear stress. So that's fun. Okay, let me do a couple example problems here. Sometimes they call the cosines of those two angles, phi and lambda, cosine phi times cosine lambda, they call it the Schmid factor. And so what they're asking you to do here is to determine the magnitude of the Schmid factor for an FCC single crystal that's oriented with its 100 direction parallel to the loading axis. So that's the direction that um, it wants to slip in. Now remember, we already talked about the FCC family of slip planes and slip directions. So for FCC, the slip plane is in the 111. It's the 111 direction. That's the most densely packed plane. And the slip direction is going to be the 1, 1 bar O direction. Okay, so that's the direction it's going to want to move between the um, most tightly packed direction. Remember for that, you've got your, um, your, your atom here at the corner, your atom here at the center, and your atom here at the bottom. So that's the most tightly packed direction. It's going to want to slip along that direction. So it's going to slip along this plane and kind of that way pointing in the direction of lambda. So we need to resolve this, okay, um, for our slip plane, slip directions, and the direction of our load that's being applied. So let's take some dot products, okay? The force applied to the shear force will be the dot product of the 100 direction that the force is applied in with the slip direction, 1, 1 bar O, okay? And when you take that dot product, you get 1 times 1 plus 0 times minus 1 plus 0 times 0, and that gives you 1, so that's your dot product. And now, um, that dot product, if you set the magnitude of the dot product, it would be equal to the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the shear force times the magnitude of cosine lambda, okay? So the magnitude of this 1, O, O vector is the square root of 1 squared plus 0 squared plus zero squared. Of course, that's one. It's a unit vector. And then the next is the magnitude of this vector, the one, one bar O, and that's the square root of one squared plus minus one squared plus zero. So that gives you the square root of two, and then times cosine lambda. And lambda, cosine lambda is what we're trying to solve for. So cosine lambda, if you set this dot product equal to the magnitude of the dot product and solve for lambda, cosine lambda, you would get cosine lambda is equal to one over the square root of two. So, that's part of it. 
Now the other is the dot product of the family of plane with the um, applied force. So there you're doing the dot product of the 100 direction for the loading uh, with the 111 family of plane. And so when you do that, you've got 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1 plus 0 times 1 again, and you get 1. So that's the total dot product. The magnitude of that dot product would be the magnitude of the force vector times the magnitude of that area vector times the cosine of phi, which is the angle there. So Yet again, the magnitude of the force is 1 because it's a unit vector. And for the 1, 1, 1, it's the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. So that gives you the square root of 3. And then times cosine of phi. Okay? And then solving for cosine of phi, you get um, cosine of phi is equal to 1 over the square root of 3. So your Schmidt factor is cosine lambda times cosine phi, which is 1 over root 3 times 1 over root 2. And if you um, figure out plug that into your calculator, you get 0 0.408. So that's your Schmidt factor. Now I want to point out that your um, direction for your, your value for your slip plane and your slip direction, they don't have to be perpendicular to one another because that's something that a lot of people do kind of think is true, but they don't have to sum to 90 degrees, those two angles. Uh, if you solve using inverse cosine of lambda, is equal to um, inverse cosine of 1 over root 2, then you get lambda is equal to 45 degrees, but solving for phi, you get 54.7 degrees. So those two don't sum to 90 degrees, and so you don't have to have your slip plane perpendicular to your slip direction. Okay, that's not always true, even though it is true, for example, for that simple cubic example that we did a little bit ago, the um, 100 family of planes and the 010 slip direction, those are perpendicular to one another. So it can happen, but it doesn't have to happen, if that makes sense. Okay, next example, because um, I think all this worth is worth repeating. Consider a single crystal of silver oriented such that a tensile stress is applied along the 001 direction. Now, if slip occurs in a 111 plane and in a 1 bar 01 direction and is initiated at an applied tensile stress of 1.1 megapascals, compute the critically resolved shear stress. Okay? So, um, here we have, we're going to solve for our cosine lambda and cosine phi again in a very similar way to the way that we did before. So we're going to do the dot product of the 001 direction with the 111 plane um, and then divide that by the magnitudes of those two vectors to get our cosine lambda. And that gives us 1 over root 3. And then for phi, we're going to do the dot product of our 001 direction with the 1 bar 01 slip direction, and that gives us 1 over square root of 2. So our Schmidt factor is yet again 1 over root 3 times 1 over root 2. Now to compute the critically resolved shear stress, you're going to multiply your stress at which slip is initiated, which was given to you in the problem as 1.1 megapascals, and then you're going to multiply that times your Schmidt factor, which is 0 0.408, just like it was before, and when you do that, you get a critically resolved shear stress of 0 0.45 megapascals. Okay? Now, Single crystals are rare. It's actually quite difficult to get a single crystal of material. It takes a long time. It takes a, a, a lot of effort. What's more common is, of course, a polycrystalline material. Okay? Now, in a polycrystalline material, um, they have a tendency to be stronger than single crystals. And the reason is that the crystals, the domains, are oriented in all kinds of crazy ways, right? So they don't necessarily line up. So those grain boundaries become barriers to the motion of the dislocation. Like, let's say that you have one and the slip direction is this way and it's going this way, but in this one, it's kind of that way, okay? Well, those aren't in the same direction. So it's slipping this way and it comes to the edge and it's trying to make it slip this way, and then it just stops, okay? So a polycrystalline material is stronger and tougher than a single crystal material because those slip planes and directions change as you go from one grain to the other.
So that means that your resolve shear stress is going to vary from one grain to another. So what's going to happen is you're going to apply a shear, you're going to apply a stress, and the grain with the largest resolve shear stress will yield first, but then the others maybe won't yield as much. Okay, so that results in sort of a resistance of the material, and it'll stop and it won't deform as much that way. Um, that makes the whole thing stronger. And the other less favorably oriented grain will yield at a larger applied force, if that makes sense, okay? So you're getting more of a resistance to the force when you um, have that. Now this, um, this SEM image right here uh, shows you some of these dislocations. These lines in the SEM image are the dislocations that have occurred. This thing has been applied, a stress has been applied, and then you can see that the slippage is in different directions along different grains, okay? Um, and that shows up uh, in this SEM image. So you can see that the slip directions are different as you go from domain to domain. You can also get anisotropy in a material, and you might want that sometimes, depending upon your part. If you roll out your metal in a certain direction, that'll stretch it out in a certain direction, and that'll make your grains not symmetric, okay? So this is an image of some isotropic grains in a material before it was rolled out, and then after you roll it out, that um, in, uh, causes the grains to be elongated in the direction of rolling, and it's an anisotropic material then. So um, what means is that under stress the boundaries are maintained but the whole grain is going to elongate in the direction of the applied force and that can cause some anisotropy in the deformation. So here they took a material that had been rolled out in a certain direction, they made a cylinder out of it and then they fired it like a little bullet at a target and um, there, here you see the deformed cylinder after it's over, it kind of splatted out like that. And if you look at the end view, you can see this isn't a circular cross section, okay? It's kind of squished out and it moved and elongated and deformed in a particular direction and that corresponds to the rolling direction of the material and the grains are stretched out in that way, okay? All right, um, I hope that's clear, but if it's not, of course, you can always contact me and come see me, um, and I look forward to seeing you in class.